December 17, 1903. The place? A windswept beach at Kitty Hawk. Something new was happening in the sky above North Carolina. Humans at last found a way to join the birds. It was the first time ever that a machine carrying a man powered itself successfully through the air. What Wilbur and Orville Wright achieved, along with their mechanic, Charles Taylor, would both open up the skies and shrink the planet. It would forever change civilization. The story of flight is a story about three men who were involved in the invention and development of the first powered airplane. First, they had to invent the airplane. Next, teach themselves to fly. Then, design and build an airplane engine. And finally, craft an original propeller. The story of flight is a story about genius. Everyone knows about Orville and Wilbur Wright, but that third man was Charles E. Charlie Taylor, a quiet genius who loved cigars and the sound of machinery. The Wright family home at 7 Hawthorne Street in West Dayton was where much of the creative thinking and planning behind the world's first airplane took place. It housed the Wright family book collection that was neither modest nor commonplace. Their father, Bishop Wright, a lifelong lover of books, heartily championed the limitless value of reading. The bishop and his wife, Susan, created within their home broad educational experiences for their children knowing that creativity and imagination are what drive human beings to excel, to invent, to innovate, and to appreciate. Their mother had considerable mechanical aptitude. As a girl, she spent many hours with her father, a wagon maker, in his carriage shop on their family farm learning how to use tools. Once she had her own family and household, she designed and built simple appliances for herself and made toys for her children. Wilbur and Orville would consult their mother whenever they needed mechanical assistance or advice. Wilbur and Orville had a variety of individual talents, skills, and personality traits that complemented one another, relying on each other's strengths and compensating for each other's weaknesses. The two were remarkably self-contained, ever industrious and virtually inseparable. They lived in the same house, worked together six days a week, ate their meals together, kept their money in a joint bank account, and even thought together. The reality is that neither probably could have achieved alone what they did as a team. Wilbur was quiet, but sure of himself. He was intellectually motivated, excelled in school, had an extraordinary memory, and was a good athlete. He was self-confident, controlled, and of steady demeanor, never rattled in thought or temper as his father described him, Highly intelligent, he was a voracious reader, a talented writer, and a gifted speaker. Wilbur always represented the brothers publicly. More impulsive than his contemplative, thoughtful older brother, Orville had boundless curiosity and energetically pursued a range of interests. His mind was quick, and he was always coming up with new inventions. While pursuing the airplane was initially Wilbur's idea, Orville's enthusiasm and optimism were often what carried them through to solutions of difficult technical problems. Despite their lack of interest in formal credentials, the brothers in fact had an education comparable to a modern four-year college degree. Wilbur and Orville formed the Wright Cycle Company in 1892, selling, repairing, and manufacturing bicycles. In the summer of 1896, Orville was struck by the dreaded typhoid. It was a month before he could set up in bed, another two weeks before he could get out of bed, and during this time Wilbur had begun reading aloud to Orville about the German glider enthusiast Otto Lilienthal, who had just recently been killed in an accident. Once fully recovered from his illness, Orville proceeded with the same reading list as Wilbur. The brothers read up on aeronautics as a physician would read his books, Bishop Wright would attest proudly. 
This was a spark that ignited Wilbur and Orville's passion for flight. On Tuesday, May 30th, 1899, Decoration Day as it was then known, Wilbur was home alone. He seated himself at his sister's small slant-top desk in the front parlor to write what would be one of the most important letters of his life. Indeed, given all that it set in motion, it was one of the most important letters in history. Addressed to the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., it filled not quite two sheets of the Wright Cycle Company's pale blue stationery, all set down in Wilbur's notably clear hand, in part stating, I am about to begin a systematic study of the subject in preparation for practical work to which I expect to devote what time I can spare from my regular business. I wish to obtain such papers as a Smithsonian Institution has published on this subject and, if possible, a list of other works in print in the English language. I am an enthusiast, but not a crank in the sense that I have some pet theories as to the proper construction of a flying machine. I wish to avail myself of all that is already known, and then if possible add my might to help on the future worker who will attain final success. Since 1898, Orville and Wilbur Wright had been using the services of a local machinist, Charles E. Charlie Taylor, for special jobs from their bicycle shop. Recognizing the need for someone to work their bicycle business while they were away at Kitty Hawk pursuing their experiments with gliders, the Wrights hired Charlie for the job in June of 1901. It was this connection that would eventually launch their first powered airplane. Charlie was born on a little farm in Cerro Gordo, Illinois, on May 24, 1868, and from an early age it was apparent that Charlie was mechanically inclined. At the age of 12, he left school and began working with machinery in a bookbinding company where mechanics came easy for him. In 1896, Charlie moved his family to Dayton, Ohio, where Charlie worked for Stoddard Manufacturing, making farm equipment and later bicycles. After one of the trips to Kitty Hawk and the dismal performance of their 1901 glider, the Wright brothers decided they needed more accurate information than was currently available and decided to build a small wind tunnel. This tool would use delicate force balances enabling them to accurately measure the amount and direction of air pressures on plane and curved surfaces when operated at various angles. Building the wind tunnel was the first job that Charlie Taylor did for the Wright brothers that had any connection with aeronautics. The Wright brothers did many experiments in this wind tunnel and they used this data to design and build the 1902 glider. On October 31st, 1902, the Wrights returned to Dayton to make plans for a powered airplane. Through their experiments, the Wrights were able to accurately predict the horsepower required to produce and achieve powered flight. They sent detailed specs to 10 companies for an engine that would produce 8 horsepower and weigh no more than 200 pounds. Within a month, all 10 companies wrote back to say, it can't be done. Failing to find any engine manufacturers who could produce or modify an engine, the Wright brothers decided to design and build their own engine, giving that task to their mechanic Charles Taylor, and they would build the airframe. Charlie and the Wright brothers sketched out their design ideas, thoroughly discussed it, and then Charlie went to work to create that impossible engine. Even with his limited knowledge about gasoline engines, Charlie welcomed this new challenge. Using his craftsmanship, genius, and enthusiasm to tackle the task, Charlie started building the engine in the winter of 1902. Later, Charlie would tell a reporter, I was on repairing bicycles back in, uh, in the 80s. And then I later went to Dayton and built bicycles for the Stoddard Manufacturing Company. And they were just starting up in the bicycle business. Then I, I got acquainted with the Wrights and I built bicycles for them. I did all the repair work while they went down Kitty Hawk to try out their gliders. Well, and all they needed was power to keep on flying. Why well, then, when we designed the motor, I made, made all the different parts in the, in the motor. I even made the crankshaft. So I made it out of a solid block of steel about 32 inches long, 6 inches wide, and inch and 5 eighths thick. 
Charlie finished the engine in six weeks. An amazing accomplishment considering he was only using a drill press, a lathe, both run by a natural gas engine, and hand tools. In February 1903, Charles E. Taylor successfully completed the first aircraft engine. Since 1899, Wilbur and Orville Wright had been scientifically experimenting with the concepts of flight. It was the Wright's genius and vision to see that humans would have to fly their machines. In Wilbur's words, it is possible to fly without motors, but not without knowledge and skill. With over a thousand glides from atop Big Kill Devil Hill, the Wrights made themselves the first true pilots. These flying skills were a crucial component in their invention, and before they ever attempted powered flight, the Wright brothers were masters of the air. In September 1903, the Wrights along with Charlie returned to their camp at Kill Devil Hills. They mounted the engine on the new 40-foot, 605-pound flyer with the intention of flight. A bulky engine and broken propeller shaft slowed them until they were finally ready on December 14th. In order to decide who would fly first, the brothers tossed a coin. Wilbur won the coin toss, but lost his chance to be the first to fly when he oversteered with the elevator after leaving the launching rail. The flyer climbed too steeply, stalled, and dove into the sand, slightly damaging the forward elevator. The flyer was airborne for only three and one half seconds, but the power of the engine and the responsiveness of the controls bolstered Wilbur's confidence. He wrote home, there is now no question of final success. Three days later, on December 17th, they were ready for a second attempt. The brothers were dressed in coats and ties that December morning for an event that would alter the world. The 27 mile per hour wind was harder than they would have liked since their predicted cruising speed was only 30 to 35 miles per hour. The headwind would slow their ground speed to a crawl, but they proceeded anyway. Now it was Orville's turn. Words were impossible over the engine's roar, so they shook hands and Orville positioned himself on the flyer. At 10.35, he released the restraining wire. The flyer moved down the rail as Wilbur steadied the wings. After a run of about 40 feet, the flyer left the ground. Again, the flyer was unruly, pitching up and down as Orville Opa compensated with the controls. Nevertheless, he kept it aloft until it hit the sand about 120 feet from the rail, a total flight of 12 seconds into the 27 mile per hour wind. The brothers took turn flying three more times that day, getting a feel for the controls and increasing their distance with each flight. The Wright machine had flown, but it would not fly again. After the last flight, it was caught by a gust of wind, rolled over, and damaged beyond easy repair. With her flying season over, the Wright sent their father a matter-of-fact telegram reporting the modest numbers behind their amazing achievement. The Wright brothers and Taylor built the first wind tunnel used for aerodynamic research. Orville designed and built instruments from old hacksaw blades and bicycle spokes to measure lift and drag, representing his solid understanding of geometry, mathematics, aerodynamic forces, and illustrated the Wright's engineering talents at their finest. The Wrights used an unusual Ford elevator mounted in front of the wings known as a canard which lessens the violent reaction that generally occurs when an aircraft with a rear-mounted elevator stalls or loses lift. With a canard, the aircraft settles more gently after a stall, a characteristic that saved the lives of Wilbur and Orville on several occasions. The Wrights placed the high point of the wings curved much closer to the wing's leading edge and made the depth of the curvature fairly shallow in contrast to the norm of the day. They believed this would reduce the movement of the center of pressure making the aircraft more stable and easier to control. The Wrights developed the first three-axis control system, which featured wing warping for lateral balance, a movable rudder, and an elevator for pitch control. A hip cradle worked the wing warping and coupled rudder. A simple wooden lever held in the left hand controlled the elevator. This three-axis control system was their single most important design breakthrough. In its final form, the 1902 Wright Glider was the world's first fully controllable aircraft. The Wright brothers and Charlie Taylor developed their first aircraft propulsion system. 
The term propulsion system is important as the Wrights and Charlie recognize that developing an effective propeller and an efficient transmission linkage to the power plant was just as crucial as building a suitable engine. The Wrights understood that relatively little engine power was needed with efficient lifting surfaces and propellers. Such propellers were not available, however. Using their wind tunnel data, the Wrights designed the first efficient airplane propeller, treating the propeller as if it were a rotary wing. Design and construction of the propellers was the Wrights most original and purely scientific achievement. Charles E. Taylor built the first wind tunnel for aeronautics. The Wrights and Charlie designed and Charlie built the first aircraft engine. Orville Wright designed and Charles Taylor constructed the first upright four-cylinder engine of the type that would power Wright aircraft over the next several years. And Charlie was the first person to investigate a powered fatal accident flight. On September 17, 1908, Charlie was slated to fly with Orville. And before the flight, larger propellers were installed to compensate for the heavier weight of the two men. At the last minute, Charlie was replaced by Lieutenant Thomas Selfridge, a 20-year-old West Point graduate from San Francisco. During the flight, Orville heard a strange noise. He looked around, but did not see anything. However, he decided to shut the engine down and land. Suddenly, there were two large thumps and the aircraft shook violently as Orville tried to control the aircraft to the ground. At about 20 feet from the ground, the aircraft started to correct itself, but it was too late. The aircraft hit the ground, killing Lieutenant Selfridge and badly injuring Orville Wright. Lieutenant Thomas Selfridge became the first passenger casualty in a powered aircraft. After the accident, Charlie investigated the crash scene and found the new propellers that they had put on before the flight had delaminated. Perhaps the most influential individuals in history, Wilbur and Orville Wright's creative and technological genius revolutionized transportation on planet Earth. The brothers, along with their mechanic Charles Taylor, helped create an entirely new world. The impact of the airplane would be beyond measure. The Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Award and the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award are the most prestigious awards the FAA issues to pilots and mechanics certified under Title 14 of the Code of Federal Regulations, Part 61. The Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Award is named after Charles E. Charlie Taylor, the first aircraft mechanic, and the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award is named after Wilbur and Orville Wright, the first U.S. pilots to recognize individuals who have exhibited professionalism, skill, and aviation expertise for at least 50 years in the aircraft maintenance profession as master mechanics and while piloting aircraft as master pilots. The candidate must meet the following criteria to be eligible for the Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Award and the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award. They must be a U.S. citizen. They must hold a U.S. Civil Aviation Authority or Federal Aviation Administration Certificated Mechanic or Repairman Certificate and a Certificated Pilot Certificate. The candidate must have 50 or more years of civil and military experience as a mechanic or repairman maintaining in registered aircraft and 50 years of flying experience while piloting in registered aircraft under the Federal Aviation Regulations for a minimum of 30 of the 50 years required. For the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award, the remaining 20 years of the required 50 years may be as a U.S. military pilot. For the Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Award, the remaining 20 years may be accepted if that individual served as an aircraft mechanic repairman in the U.S. military or worked as an uncertificated person in a U.S. aviation maintenance facility that maintained U.S. registered aircraft or worked as an uncertificated person in the aircraft manufacturing industry in the United States, producing U.S. type certificated or U.S. military aircraft. For the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award, a current flight review or medical certificate is not required at the time of nomination. Prior accident history and or prior enforcement actions, excluding revocations, are not necessarily disqualifying. 
but will be reviewed and can be disqualifying if they show that the nominee lacks a dedication to safe flight or professionalism. Revocation of any airman certificate, mechanic or pilot, will disqualify a nominee for either award. The candidate must have three letters of recommendation from their peers for the Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Award and three letters of recommendation from their peers for the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award. The awards may be presented to a nominee up to three years posthumously if the nominee has acquired 50 years of U.S. piloting or mechanic experience prior to passing away. The recipient will receive the official FAA Blue Ribbon Package that is a complete history of the Airman's mechanic and pilot achievements as documented by the FAA in Oklahoma City. It is a certified true copy of every document on file with the FAA. The recipient will receive distinctive lapel pins for the Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Award and for the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award after application review and eligibility requirements have been met. Upon request, stick pins similar in design to the Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Award and the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award lapel pins are also provided to the award recipient's spouse in recognition of his or her support to the recipient's aviation maintenance and piloting career. Once the Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Award and the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award have been issued, the recipient's name, city, and state of residence, plus the month and year of the award presentation will be posted to the Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Award Electronic Roll of Honor and the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award Electronic Roll of Honor located on the web at www.fasafety.gov. The recipient will receive two distinctive certificates signed by the FAA Administrator, one for the Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Award and one for the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure we introduce to you and take a brief look at the life of our newest Charles Taylor Master Mechanic and Wright Brothers Master Pilot Awards recipient. <laughs>